Thanks. <laughs> Welcome to the December 11th, 2018 Board of Selectmen meeting. Please stand as we salute the flag. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this has to be a record for a selectman's meeting. It has to be. Um, tonight's meeting has one agenda item. Just one item. All our selectman meetings have an agenda, followed by comments from citizens. Tonight's meeting, the one agenda item is a presentation to Nahant from Northeastern University. After the presentation, there will be a citizens forum for Northeastern to answer questions and for people to speak their minds. That's what our citizens forum part is on the selectmen's meetings. To begin the citizens forum, I've decided um, as chairman of this board of selectmen that the following people will um, speak first, second, third, and fourth, and then line up and speak as you wish. What I'm asking is that when you come up, you give your name and address for the record. To begin, I have selected Pete Rogers as number one, Susan Solomon as number two, Mike Manning as number three, and Jeff Musman as number four. That's as fair as a, as a chairman of a board of selectmen can do. From then on, these guys have it. So I'm going to send over for further comments to our town administrator. And before we start, if you all haven't seen it, there's the picture. Thank you, Peter. Now, my last sentence probably doesn't make sense, but I wrote this today and I said, yeah, let's, let's try it with all of us. Let us together show that we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, T. Um, you know, I just want to start by thanking uh, you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank Board of Selectmen and Town Hall staff for working around the clock to put this together. Um, you know, the Board of Selectmen asked me to help lead this process of conversations with Northeastern. And through that, we have had a number of meetings where Northeastern has presented to us different variations of their potential expansion. And tonight um, is truly a, a, a checkpoint in that process where the Board of Selectmen and myself are eager to hear feedback from the residents tonight and after tonight. Um, the chairman, uh, as we mentioned at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, after Northeastern presents, we should have about an hour of time for Citizens Forum, maybe a little bit more. Um, but we, the chairman has asked that we limit comments to about two and a half minutes apiece and ask that questions be focused primarily about the information that's being presented tonight as compared to general statements of position. Uh, however, you know, there are multiple opportunities uh, to provide such comments uh, through either the survey that we have on our website, there's some multiple choice questions on there, and then there's an open comment uh, block at the end of that. And also today we created a residence at nahant.org email account, so you can also submit open feedback to that email address. Um, just to reiterate, there is, you know, there's, we've mentioned this at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, there's no vote being taken tonight. This is uh, informational purposes only. And also for those at home, we are having some technical issues with our broadcasting equipment. And so if you're watching at home and the TV channel uh, fails to work, 
there we are streaming this online and there's a link to that on our website um, or through our if you go on to uh, the town hall Facebook the link is on there as well um, lastly we also have the PDF that Northeastern is going to be presenting on our website so you can download that and follow along and um, this is being recorded as well so we will be able to post that as soon as possible so we're doing the best we can to provide residents as much access to this presentation and as much access for uh, feedback as possible so you know bear with us on the technical stuff but that's that's all I have so Northeastern it's all you. Thank you. So good evening, Nahant, and uh, thank you to the Board of Selectmen and uh, the Town Administrator for arranging this meeting. Uh, my name is Ralph Martin. I am the a senior vice president and general counsel at Northeastern University. Uh, I come here tonight not wearing a legal hat, uh, really wearing a hat as part of a team of Northeastern representatives who have been working on this project for a long period of time. I will introduce them shortly. Um, we began this process in February with a meeting here Probably many of you were here. Uh, I think it's fair to say that was not the best kickoff, at least uh, for uh, an engagement that we hope to achieve success in. But that's OK. Uh, many successes start out with a failure. Um, we, we hope to be successful in explaining to the town of Nahant why there is an opportunity for the town of Nahant to achieve a vision and preserve all that is special about this, ta this town, and for us to persuade you why our desire to, to add to the Marine Science Center does not violate any of the spirit or passion that you feel about the town and helps us accomplish a broader, very important mission. Um, we think it's possible, and I think life shows that it's, good po that it's possible for good people to be on opposite sides of an issue. And I think through this process, we hope that we engage, and in fact, we have engaged many of you, but we hope that we engage you in finding some point of mutuality that we can all agree on. As Tony said, this is a checkpoint. It's not the end of the process. There's more work to be done. This is a checkpoint. And we look forward to other engagements with you as we move along this process. So let me introduce key members of the Northeastern team who are here today. Kathy Spiegelman, who's our Vice President of Campus Planning. Uh, John Tobin, who's here somewhere. He's our Vice President of City and Community Affairs. Matt Kate, who's our Project Manager. Um, Jeff Tressel, many of you know, who's the chair and director of the Marine Science Center. Bob Schaffner is here with many members of the architectural firm Payette. After I speak, Bob will take over and walk you through the different dimensions of our design approaches. So over the past several months since February, we've engaged many individuals in the town as well as uh, the Board of Selectmen on an individual basis, as well as Tony Barletta. And we've heard a lot of concerns. Many of the concerns are uniform, uh, and some of the concerns are different, and some of the concerns actually compete with one, uh, with one another. So part of our exercise, excuse me, part of our exercise has been to try and take it all in, it, take, take all of the information in and process it and then be able to present to the town, much as you would almost in a, in, a, in a classroom, what your work has been since then to respond to those concerns. So what I hope to do here is walk you through the way we've approached this exercise, and then Bob will actually go through uh, the presentation of the different models. 
we're going to offer three different approaches that offer three different solutions to creating a, a, an addition at the Marine Science Center. We call the, because we're in the early stages, we call them Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C. And the first design that you will see is a modification of the first design that you saw. Um, and if you were to ask us yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we, we would tell you it's our preferred approach. Why? Because it builds everything on one site, it's the least costly, and from a scientific perspective, it's the most efficient. But we did hear a lot of concerns at the meeting and since then about the structure, how it presents itself visually. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take a run at two other different design approaches. They're less efficient, they're more costly, but we think they demonstrate more sensitivity to the criticisms that we've heard. Then the third approach, option C, actually reduces the contemplated addition to the east side of the bunker by almost 50%. So what's our goal? Our goal is to build on the success of the Marine Science Center and create a world-class institute one that's respectful of its neighbors regarding its locations and its visibility and presentation. So as we go through this march, uh, this march and this exercise, I want to make sure you understand the, the, the variety of concerns that we were trying to balance. And by the way, we're not, presenting, we're not pretending that's the end of the concerns. But these are the concerns that we've heard to date. We wanted to minimize the visibility of any addition. We wanted to create less visibility from a variety of different vantage points. And while we can't create an absolutely invisible structure, we think we've gone a long way to addressing some of those concerns. We also want to achieve a high level of energy efficiency. We want to achieve LEED Gold certification and utilize geothermal energy as much as possible. The importance of using geothermal is that it allows us to bury a lot of the mechanical structures underground and therefore avoid roof lines with all sorts of mechanical and air conditioning and ha air handling equipment. So that means in one of the designs, for instance, that we take up 11,000 square feet underground to achieve that efficiency. We also wanted to work within existing environmental boundaries and buffer zones. And we wanted to do this, including the Nahant zoning bylaws, to, uh, in order to avoid any variance, any requirement for a variance. And of course, if you drive by the site, one of the things you could appreciate is we want to eliminate the trailers. They don't look good uh, and they're outdated, so we wanted to eliminate the trailers. Another important goal that we wanted to achieve is we wanted to enhance the surrounding green space. The current project footprint is overrun by invasive species. We think there is huge opportunity in restoring and enhancing the plant and wildlife habit habitat, and that will also promote biodiversity. People have also expressed concern about the impact of the project on seawater temperatures. So since the meeting in February, we've paid a lot of attention to that. And under the guidance of the Massachusetts DEP and the Environmental Protection Agency, we've been monitoring our seawater discharge temperatures. And the data that we have, thank you, indicates that our current discharge system does not have a significant effect on water temperatures in Bathing Beach Cove. And we are confident and committed to maintaining that stability with any addition that we achieve going forward. So let me address some of the other things. And, and in a prior meeting, I think in the, um, in the late, uh, late summer, early fall, fall here in Town Hall, one of the things we said is anything, any project like this 
necessarily generates rumors and suspicion. We understand that. And one of the things we said is, unless you hear from us or the Board of Selectmen, please don't jump to conclusions. So, so let, me, let me tell you a couple of things we, we are not doing. We are not building conference or dining hall facilities. We're not renting, we're not building a facility that we will rent out for conferences. We will not be building housing or dorms. And we will not be buying other buildings in Nahat. Plain and simple. Uh, we were also asked about, for instance, why, why not build on top of the existing Edwards building? Well, the plain fact is that the Edwards building is an old army bunker, and we have retrofitted it as much as possible, and it can't stand any more load. Uh, but one of, one, of the, one of the design schemes you will see does incorporate part of the addition next to the, um, the Edwards building. And we've heard from a number of people that we're sort of used to seeing you there, so if you thought about building there, that might not offend as many sensibilities. So you will see a design scheme that does incorporate that. Now here's, here's a prominent question uh, that we don't expect to satisfy everyone uh, with this answer, but it's just, it's, it's, it, it, we need to address it. Why not build somewhere else? Yeah. Yeah. And that goes to the passion of the town. And that goes to people's commitment to preserving all that is good about Nahant. But, I ask you to consider, we ask you to consider, when we were first approached by the town of Nahant in 1966 to acquire the land to avoid commercialization, we took it on as a project. And actually, that became the birth of the marine ecological uh, um, science. That, that really became where marine eco ecology was born in the late 60s and the early 70s. And since then, it's become a leading research facility where we spent who knows how many tens of thousands of, of hours and tens of millions of dollars to enhance it without violating the sensibilities or the spirit of what it means to be uh, a respectful neighbor. And we ask you to consider that. Would you walk away from a project that you've sunk time, energy, and significant amount of resources in? I think you try to work with your neighbors, and that's what we're trying to do. We've heard people say that we are not good neighbors. So once you get beyond the criticism, what does being a good neighbor look like? And we're, we're willing to hear more of the substance of what it would, what, how could we be a better neighbor to people and the institutions in Nahant? We're still committed to the funding for the Johnson School that helps to uh, fund a uh, particular uh, teacher slot. We're still committed to the scholarships that we offer. But what would being a better neighbor look like? Let me turn to the question of the impact of traffic on the hunt. So we've done a study. We worked with the selectmen. We hired an independent traffic consultant who's been monitoring the traffic. So here's what we have. I don't, I don't know what the perceptions about traffic in the hunt were or are, but here's what the data shows. The average daily traffic for vehicles traveling inbound and outbound both ways past the Tides restaurant is approximately 7,900 cars, inbound and outbound per day. Approximately 1,700 cars travel inbound and outbound both ways past Town Hall. So if you do the math, that means approximately 850 cars travel each way past Town Hall or outbound past Town Hall. 
And of that approximately 1,700 cars traveling past Town Hall, on average, 175 enter and exit the Northeastern Campus gate daily. That includes DPW vehicles, that includes de delivery trucks, that includes people who live in Nahan who also work at the Marine Science Center. But if you just sort of gross it up and say 150 enter and exit, which means you know about 85, uh, uh, 87 and a half, one way in, one way out, that accounts for 2% of the traffic in the hunt. So we think it's important to put the facts out there. We think it's important to put what our thinking is out there, recognizing that we are not done. And we look forward to continued conversations. So with that, let me turn it over to Bob Schaffner. Thank you, Ralph. Oops. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So what we have is about 15 minutes of presentation that I'll support with graphics, not being as compelling a speaker as Ralph was. We'll use the advantage of the big screens and some nice images for you. Um, what we'd like to do is show the three schemes that Ralph mentioned, and um, we'll use the uh, screen for that. And then after that 15 minutes, we'll, um, the selectmen had asked if we could produce a model to help them understand the project better. So at the end, I'll walk over to the model. We have a camera set up. The AV guys will switch over, and we'll end up, I'll illustrate the three that way. Um, perhaps afterwards if people want to come up. It's easier to engage in a much closer setting. But we'll do our best through the uh, AV system to have you experience the model as well. It seemed to help their understanding of what the project is about. So as you see behind me is the image of the site as it is from the air. And I wanted to mention that one of the first things we do when a client comes to us, they have a brief for a project. They have a purpose and a meeting, a meaning, uh, a mission and a need that they identify. And the first thing we do is work very closely with the users of the facility to try to understand those needs. So what I wanted to do is take a few moments to define for you what the 60,000 square feet that's been mentioned so much, what does it mean? So out of 60,000 square feet, that's called gross square feet. That's the entire enclosed area of a building. Every single inch within the walls of the building from the outside of the wall to the end. Now, as part of that, there's the net usable program area. And so what we've illustrated on the right is what the 32,650 square feet are that constitute the usable space. And what that is, is that you've got primarily research space. These are the laboratories. And just to put in this in perspective, where Edward sits now, they have individuals, because it's an old army barracks, it's very cellular laboratories. Each, each uh, uh, investigator has their own little space. What we've been able to do is look at conglomerating groups of people who have similar shared interests into neighborhoods that could be in shared labs, and that allows a more efficient approach. So we're using every technique that we have at our availability to make it an efficient building around that research. Beyond that, there are, oh, I'm sorry, there are some teaching facilities for the undergraduates who come out and learn the techniques. And then there are meeting spaces, conference rooms, essentially. And then there's administrative space and offices for those faculty and support space that support the, uh, the endeavor. Now, it's important to note the rest of that square footage. What is the rest of 60,000 square feet? In a science building, there are a significant amount of support spaces. But it also includes restrooms, shaft space, wall thicknesses, corridors, things like that are not considered usable area. But also what's important to note is that in this particular building, 11,000 square feet of mechanical space enclosed within the building. And this is important. This investment is very important to do. Many buildings don't have to do that. They can put things on rooftops. We did not think that was appropriate in this case. So what this does, it incorporates it in most of the schemes. It's underneath the building, slung under it, and in many cases underground. Okay, So that's what constitutes the 60,000 gross square feet. 
Now the next thing we do as we're working with the users to understand the functionality of the building, how do we arrange it, what are the program pieces, is also to understand the site. As we look at an aerial view of the site, this will, what we'll do is we'll begin from a photograph and you can see Edwards to the left and you can see Lodge Park to the right, north being up on the screen. So we've taken that same aerial view and we've turned it into a drawing and the first thing it illustrates is you can see a dash line, a dark dash line, which represents the property line of their property. And then you can see a little bit of an offset. There's a gray area beyond that. Those are the yard setbacks that are required you know, uh, to uh, zoning side yard setbacks. The other things you can see in this drawing are the dark gray outlines are the buildings above grade that exist today, primarily Edward and the supporting buildings. And then you can also see in gray, in this area here, this is the Murphy bunker. In the darker gray, or the medium gray, is the usable space within that bunker. It's the, the level underneath it. The next lighter gray around it is the blast shield, which are the sloped concrete walls that kept the, uh, if any, missiles projections were coming. That would protect the facility. Interestingly enough, I don't know how many folks know that there is another bunker over uh, uh, towards the road, which was the plotting room. That was where the plans were uh, kept. And that also has an underground space and a slope battlement around it as well. And also, you notice where these little lines get closer and closer around these buildings. Those are sloped earth. Those are contours. When we show the model later, I think you'll understand. And you know from the site that it's very steep slope. So that's what those lines represent. The next thing that we are going to layer, I'm going to do a layering here to show some of the site considerations. The next one is the legal easement, which provides, allows access for everyone in, up to uh, Lodge Park. The next thing is there's a wetland just south of Edwards. And this includes not only the wetland, but the 100 foot setback that's required. It's a buffer zone. So that's the whole wetland plus buffer zone in blue. The next thing is the 100 foot coastal bank buffer, uh, coastal bank buffer zone. And that's got the red outline on it and it's shown in the, the light red color. The next consideration is the FEMA zone floodplain overlay district. So it seems like it's really encroaching. You can get the sense of what's going on here. Finally, you made a, a, a big, uh, the vote this year to change your town um, wetland bylaw with this regulated area. So this is now that new further restriction of the site uh, through that in yellow. So as you can see, what's really interesting is buildable area for a pretty ample site. There is not an enormous amount of buildable area here. So what we're going to do, we're going to share with you how the designs evolved. And I wanted to share some early guiding principles with you. So the first was that if we could integrate this facility with the existing Murphy bunker, there's a fair amount of research that goes on in that bunker. It's more the water-oriented stuff, the seawater that comes in, so a lot of the large tables with the sea life. That's in there. And we thought if we could make a connection, somehow uh, tie into that by building near or on Mur uh, Murphy Bunker, we could make better use of that, make them feel connected, but also maybe be more efficient in the space use which is what we did. The next one is to preserve the open area of the site as much as possible. The next one was to locate the building above the anticipated sea level rise. Utilize something to keep the building up, especially since its focus is coastal sustainability in communities like yours. And finally, that the height and massing respond to zoning requirements. It's very important in Northeastern to do that. There are requirements, stay with them. So the first scheme is something similar to what you saw back in February. And what you see, what we've got on the left is a site plan um, diagram, really. And it shows the proposal in blue. And the idea was to say, what if we had a very simple rectilinear building that put the research labs and offices on the top floor, one level, and slung all the support space and mechanical underneath it and buried that. That's what that idea is. And then it was also oriented to connect to both the north and the south gun ports are what pinned its length down. So by dropping a staircase down, they could literally tie to who, uh, to the research going on down below and kind of unify them into the facility. 
another guiding principle that we thought was very important, and this might have been naive, but we thought the most important thing would be as you approach the site, you come up 40 steps, and as you turn that corner, you see the site. We thought no one would want to see the building from the approach to the site. And I think that's probably a fair thing to say, that people wanted it. That's what drove this design. So the cross section of it, now up in the top left, you'll see a diagram of that same building. And in red, it shows where you, if you ever did a slice through the building, that's where the slice is. And you're looking north. And what this shows is the existing bunker. This is at the thicker part of the building. You can see how it steps out. It's very thin at the ends. It gets a little thicker towards the main entrance. So the thicker part, and we perched the building and rested, actually used that concrete as the foundation to have to, have to uh, minimize how much we touch the rest of the site. And then by shifting it just a bit to the east, we could actually tuck the mechanical space and support underneath it and mostly bury it. Now, you're going to notice on the drawings I show later, the amount that this piece is buried varies very high in the middle. And then as it gets closer to those gun ports, it drops off. And I'll share the renderings of this with you um, now. And in this case, an important number uh, to see is that we've broken down the area of the building to show what is the area above the bunker to the east. And you'll see subsequent schemes that get smaller. So here's that site plan again, looking down on it within the site cons considerations, how it fits within that. And it does tuck itself within all those. And important, it preserves as much of the meadow as we could. Now, as we look at that in terms of a rendered site plan, what you're seeing is this is a, uh, showing the intentions of the project from a landscape point of view. So let me walk with you a, a little bit around what these considerations are. First is that parking. Um, the first thing was to take care of cars. And according to your zoning guidelines, the number of parking spaces, we've decided that the best way to handle it is let's get rid of the trailers and utilize that space for primary parking. And then to fit the rest of the parking, let's put a bit on the south end so that we don't overwhelm any particular part of the site with parking. Now, it's important to say that we've taken this stand to say this is what the town requires. If for any reason the town wants to discuss less parking, Northeastern's willing to talk about that, but we thought we'd at least start with what your zoning asks for, okay? The other thing this site plan does is it shows that we're removing the site, the parking that currently exists in that basin, that central space on the campus. And right now, that drainage goes right into the ground from the cars. What we're intending to do here is to gather any of the water that falls into that parking lot treated underground before it ever enters any system. According to DEP guidelines, this will be all treated before it goes into the, uh, into the system. The other thing to mention is that you do have a wetland to the south. And in this case, we're keeping that existing wetland resource area. We can't really mess with that. We have no interest in messing with that. Another uh, consideration is that Ralph mentioned geothermal wells. By using geothermal, we're able to avoid heavy mechanical equipment, in particular cooling towers. I don't know if you've seen cooling towers, but a lot of time they are noisy, they're unsightly, and there's a plume often of uh, evaporating water uh, above. So we're able to avoid that, and it's a highly sustainable way of providing heating and cooling for the project. But also important is Northeastern sees an opportunity to restore a habitat in this area because it's so overtaken by invasive species for many, many years. And they think it's an opportunity to enhance the wildlife and plant life in that area. Now, what you'll see, you see these two marks. These are views, viewpoints, your camera. What you're going to see are uh, the subsequent views are taken from those points. OK, so we'll show some renderings. So excuse me for a moment. I'll let you stare at that while I try to quench. So the way we set these renderings up are each view you see will be a winter view on top, a summer view on the bottom. We want it to be able to see it with leaves and without. So the approach view of that scheme, you can see the first thing is that the, entra the existing entrance, uh, what we call, I guess, portal, right? You can see it up here. 
So that's kind of your, your marker. That's what exists today. The last time you saw this in February, we were proposing an elevator there to get up and into that upper level and then a bridge connecting it back. Uh, since then, we've realized that instead, what we can do is perhaps literally drill down into the bunker to get an elevator back so you wouldn't see it. So that's why it differs from what you saw in February. But again, our primary objective when we began was thinking that this was the view and from 40 steps, you wouldn't want to see anything. And I challenge you to actually tell me where it is. If you really look closely, there's kind of little peaks that you get. But the idea was to make this glass, simple, 14 uh, foot high research component that would, in a sense, vanish in the trees was the goal of this. Now, where people got a little bit worked up, if I remember correctly, was this side, which was from Lodge Park. And we failed to understand at that time how sensitive people were to this because we thought upon entering Lodge Park, you're looking out to the east and the north and the south, anywhere but west. But yet, what we did to the west is look at least let's make it mirrored glass, keep it as low slung as possible, and bury as much as we can. We put tick marks on the drawing just so that you can always see where the ends are of the building. And this will vary scheme to scheme. So what you'll notice is that we were able to use the topography near the middle to do the most screening, but because we were trying to enter the north and south gun ports, we could not grade the earth up high enough to screen it fully. So the space that we we're talking about, the mechanical and the support space underneath, the research space above, and that's what this proposal is about. Now, Northeastern still, it is the most efficient scheme, as you can imagine, being a simple rectangle, everything consolidated in one place. But what we heard was, can we look at other schemes? And we had some suggestions from people saying, I think this was called the saddle scheme, saying, can you split the, the, that east bar, can you take that and split it in half and put half of it to the left of it, right? So what this does, tries to take advantage of, it makes it about half the length of the one you just saw, and by taking the pieces that were north and south, sling them to the west side of it. And it had some interesting effects. Uh, one is, you'll see, this is slightly smaller. There are some other techniques we use to try to reduce this a bit further than the 60. And in this particular scheme, we were able to achieve that. So the cross section, the same kind of view you took before, again, you can see the key on the upper left, is to say we've still got the research above mechanical on the east, but it's half the length it used to be and about half the area that it used to be. It used to be about 33,000 square feet on that half. The other important thing is, if you notice the drawing, now we're able to change the way the grading works around it. And whoever suggested this, I believe this was what they had in mind, that you can then, it's easier to screen it with plantings once you can raise the earth a bit higher. And I can explain what I mean later, why I can do that on all sides. And then the west piece is more the office functions uh, exist over here. So if I go to the um, site plan, you see that it safely sits within the, uh, the restrictions of the site. And then on the site plan, it's pretty much the same um, landscape concept. So those won't vary from scheme to scheme. But as we go to the views, from the approach view, you will probably notice now because we put a piece of building to the west, you can begin to see a corner of it on the south end more prominently than you did the last scheme because it's closer to you here by about 50 feet. And because the slope falls off so quickly, it's harder to get trees realistically to be high enough to screen that. Whether this matters to people, we don't know. Because what you're going to notice is that there's a significant difference on this side. So from Lodge Park, it's in a sense, it's nearly invisible. So we put the tick marks on to show it's half the length it used to be. And then in the uh, s uh, winter and the summer views. But what we were able to do is because we're not reaching out to the gun ports, we were able to begin sloping up to its height earlier just by using some topography. Then the plantings can do a much better job in screening it because they don't have to be so tall. They can be modest sized trees will easily screen this. And now I thought this would be interesting for people to see a comparison. This happens to pick winter because it's the more difficult to screen just to show the difference between that proposal and what we had before. Okay, so this is uh, I think a clear way of illustrating this. And this is what it looks like in summer, the difference between the two schemes. So again. Now, finally, we had questions about Edwards. And um, 
as Ralph mentioned, we could not build on top of Edwards. It's really in very difficult shape to add to. It has no structural capacity whatsoever. There is room between Edwards and the plotting bunker, plan bunker, slight bit of area that we could put 13,000 gross square feet. We peeled that part out, some of the offices and administrative functions, left the research um, to here, and it was able to minimize that to, now we're down to 44,000 square feet on the bunker. So what you'll notice as we look at the uh, cross section is nearly identical because you don't see the Edwards project, but the left piece is slightly smaller than the prior. The site plan is very similar, but you can see there's very limited area that we could tuck a building in between that steep slope and Edwards. And then the site plan is very similar to the other that you saw. It has the same intentions. What's different here is that perhaps you, be, you can't really see the addition behind Edwards yet, but you can sleep a slight bit of the building here, but it's better than it was in the prior scheme because it's slightly smaller because of what we're building at Edwards. As we get closer, we're going to show an existing view first. These are the trailers that Northeast would like to remove. And as we look at it before and after, the winter view up top and the summer view below. And by the way, there's no design for a building. We just rendered something that looks plausible for a two-story building in this place. In the winter, you could probably see a little bit tucked against. You see the slope of the old uh, bunker. And then in the summer, it's pretty much entirely screened by planting. The next view is the existing view from the existing Murphy Bunker entrance, looking back at Edwards. This is with the trailers. We'd like to get rid of them. And in this case, this shows that uh, parking area to the north. And you can see this is what that building would be like tucked behind Edwards here. And that's in the summer below, winter above. And then it's essentially the same. Both schemes B and C are the same from the east. They're the same configuration of, from Lodge Park. And this slide is just summarizing what you just saw in, in terms of data. Um, what I thought we'd do now, if, if it matters, um, I don't know how well it'll come out on the screen, but I can manipulate the model and see if that helps people understand this. Um, it seemed to really help the selectmen when we shared it with them. OK. so. And what we'll do, there's, there's an interesting thing I just wanted to share. Let's see if this will work. OK. As I look at it this way, I just wanted to share with you, as we look at it from the approach side, I wanted to show it from eye height. Because may, oftentimes, we ask people to look at projects as you would as a, a person approaching it. Problem with models, when you look down on them, they're very deceiving. It's very rare that you fly over from Logan into Logan. You do get a chance. But that won't be your most irritating view of this project. So here, it's just to show our intention is to hide it in the trees. And I'll even bring it around. But you'll see from the Lodge Park side, it's harder to screen the north and south ends of the building. So it is certainly more visible from Lodge Park. This is scheme A. This is the original proposal um, that you, similar to what you saw in February, scheme A. So, if you notice, I'm taking out the um, trailers, because they'll be gone in all three schemes. And I don't know if you can see. Let's see if I can guide you. I'm not a hand model, so I don't know. Uh, the, um, this is the revised connection to where we could drill in to get an elevator down into the Murphy bunker. But essentially, it's a very simple rectangle that sits on top of the site and that's the configuration. Now, it's one story building on top of the bunker, then with mechanical underneath it. So it's hard to define other than, did the cross section help when we showed that, how it sits? It's technically a one story building with basement. It's a 14, it's a 14 foot high. Um, research part on the top, and then it varies how it meets the gra grade. But its uh, mean average height is below the 30 feet requirement for this site. 
Now, the other scheme, scheme B, first I'll show the view from the approach. And that the idea is that it's intended that it's fully screened um, behind the trees, except possibly the two corners might be visible uh, on that approach. But as I place it into the site, just to have you understand where it sits in the context, just like this. So it's half the length. And I don't know if you can tell uh, from where you sit. Can you lift it out and show them the view from Lodge Park, though? The same way you did ion. You mean rotate or? Pull it out. Oh, right. Got it. Got it. Sorry. Right. Sorry. Thanks, Jeff. So from Lodge Park, it's intended to be screened entirely because there's all this grading we're able to do. We have plenty of room to actually get the grading up and around it. Uh, I, it, I guess you'd say, is it a valley? Uh, let me see if I can exp show it on here. Yeah, we would be putting material. Can anyone see the, uh, the contours in this area here? Those contours are, say, 50 feet to 100 feet outside the footprint of the building that would slope from that level down to natural grade. And again, if the idea was, if we can bring it up, in fact, even above the floor line of that upper level, in fact, create a berm, you'd only have, uh, say, 10 feet of the building height exposed that could easily be screened by plantings. Because, okay. Uh, we do not have access roads in the back. There might have to be a, a path that's reinforced for fire protection for a vehicle to be able to fight fire on that side. But right now, there's not that much design work done on the site for the beyond to know that, for example, what we have in Explore is that we don't know where the town sits on whether if preserving the ecology is one thing versus having paths and walking. We don't know where the desire is for, uh, for how much access we want to have back there. But other than the, uh, the pathways that we required for reinforcing the ground to be able to handle fire trucks are the only thing that we anticipate at this time there. So the way the site works for Scheme B is this is where we're saying the, uh, the space that was taken off the ends of the research bar have now created this west wing. In Scheme C, the difference is that we can reduce about this much, 13,000 square feet, take that off, and place it behind Edwards in a two-story addition there, just about like that. So that makes up for the difference of about this much space here. I'll leave that there. And I think at that point, we can open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Is it working? Thank you. Pete Rogers, 44 Pearl Road. First, I want to thank T and Enzo and Richie and Tony for their diligence in negotiating with Northeastern and for bringing this meeting together. And I particularly want to thank the Northeastern team for making every effort they can to accommodate the concerns of the community and for the extraordinary amount of money they have spent on architectural redesign to minimize the impact on the environment. At this point, I need to confess that this issue 
has become extremely personal for me. I was told yesterday morning by my oncologist that the immunotherapy that I had been on was not working, the cancer had come back rapidly, and that I had two or three weeks to live. So I want you to know that if I go silent after this meeting, it's not because someone has changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of thing can focus the mind, and I've spent significant time lately pondering the worth of my life in the sense of, have I served my country? Have I given sufficient time to my community and to other groups I've served with? And what lessons of character and perspective have I left for my daughter and my nieces and nephews? Which gets me to the point of this. My concern is the communities also have to go through that kind of assessment. What debts do they owe the past? What obligations do they owe to the future? And what is the very purpose and nature of their existence as a community? This dispute is about beauty. I'd like to take a slightly different perspective on that and point out that Nahant has these large wild spaces at East Point and Bailey's Hill because the US government, given the emergencies of World War I and World War II, needed to tear apart much of that, much of the beauty of this town. Furthermore, when the military was done with these places, at least at East Point, we didn't want them. Northeastern half a century ago took up the burden of caring for the bulk of the space. They own it, we don't. During World War II, in addition to coast defense, we did important scientific work particularly on underwater acoustics. I mention this because Nahant rose to the occasion in two national emergencies, but we have now entered a third world war, greater in duration and certainly greater in economic impact. I am speaking of the war against global warming, climate change, and rising sea levels. Just a few examples of the impact already. The UN estimates that there are 68.5 million people forcibly displaced in the world. The Syrian civil war was preceded by a 12-year drought, making parts of that ancient land incapable of supporting human life. The result has been a migration crisis that has destabilized much of Europe. In the U.S., we've experienced one severe hurricane after another, Katrina, Sandy, Houston, Puerto Rico, the Florida and Panhandle, North Carolina, with billions and billions and billions of dollars in losses. 17 government agencies have just come out with a report suggesting that by the end of the century, our economy could lose 10% of its GDP. The only tools we have to combat these future threats are human ingenuity, human adaptability, first-rate scientific research all over the world, and brilliant political leadership to point out and make persuasive the sacrifices we will have to make. Northeastern has proved, to my satisfaction at least, its good faith when it talks about the mission of this Global Sustainability Institute, which seeks to bring together the best interdisciplinary talent to address the many challenges the coastal communities are facing now and in the future. The threats posed by storm surge, sea level rise, overexploitation of fisheries and pollution are only going to grow as humans concentrate their communities and economies on the world's coastlines and the inexorable march of climate change continues. I am disturbed by these stories circulating around here that all of this is a coverage story for a big conference center to make money. I believe that Northeastern has proved its intention to do what it says it's going to do and has shown good faith and its determination. I believe that each of us has to look at his life and assess its value and choice points when people have to decide whether they will give something up or to continue with their comforts and pleasures. 
communities also have to face those choice points. And I would hope that once the hysteria subsides, we behave as a community in a way consistent with our history of doing what is necessary in times of national emergency, and that we think very hard about how privileged and lucky we have been to live in this beautiful place and to think about what our legacy, what our gift will be to future generations. And in practical terms, this partnership with Northeastern can be valuable in so many ways. First, in giving us practical advice based on the research on how to adapt to rising sea levels and storm surge. Second, they can be very helpful to us in terms of our pressing infrastructure needs. And the third thing that is, if down the road it turns out that there is a need for adjustments in state legislation in order to, for, for communities to protect themselves against rising seas, Northeastern can be a tremendous partner in that legislative effort for many communities. There will be disruptions during the construction phase and the building, as much as possible, will not be an obtrusive eyesore on the landscape. I urge you to do the right thing, to embrace this partnership. It is good for all of us to raise our sights, to do what we can as a community for those who come after us. Thank you. Short, but that'll that'll be okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> My name is Susan Solomon. I live at Five Wendell Road in Nahant. I'm a professor of environmental science at MIT, where I teach and do research in climate science and atmospheric chemistry in the Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences Department. EAPS. Our work is uh, closely related to what goes on in the Marine Science Center, and uh, we have classrooms, laboratories, offices, meeting spaces, much like MSC. So I came to the February meeting um, with an open mind and actually inclined to be supportive as a colleague, but the more I've heard and learned, the more concerned I've become. And I'm concerned because what we've seen has been extremely hard for me to make sense of as an academic based on my experience. I'm also concerned as a citizen. Let me tell you a little bit about my department, and I'm going to make some comparisons with what we've heard. So my department has 64,000 square feet of space in our building, and we have about 350 total people, professors, postdocs, grad and undergraduate students who are actually doing research, not just taking classes and technical and administrative staff. So that's an average of about 183 square feet per person. And we're not crowded. We have plenty of space, and our classrooms are actually um, very comfortable. I've read the FAQs about the proposed expansion very carefully, and I expected them to be careful and clear, and especially after the promises made in this room on February 15th to work earnestly on communicating better with the people of Nahant. So imagine my surprise to see them state uh, a proposal of 60,000 square feet of additional research space, not total gross square footage, but additional research space. It says that in your FAQs. I invite you to go and look. And only 36 additional people. So that's a remarkable 1,660 square feet per person, which is nine times more space than my department. So maybe that number is really a number like 114, which is another one floating around. But you know that's still a lot more than my department. And the numbers that have been quoted tonight of uh, about half of this, let's call it 30,000 square feet, only brings that number down to four and a half times the size of my department. I also rechecked in my memory that in this room on February 15th, we were told that the addition would be a dry building without seawater labs, wet labs. So I'd like to understand what the 36 people or 114 people or whatever it is are going to be doing with that research space. I just want to understand. And I'm also surprised to see a number of 20 new faculty 
new faculty in the FAQs when your entire department here and in Boston is about 22 tenured or tenured track faculty. So um, an additional 20 faculty, in, you have about 10 of them, of them here, teaching only 45 to 60 students is more remarkable yet, so I'd like to understand those numbers. It's just not enough to say how many total square feet would be added under an MSC proposal. We need an open and complete discussion of how that space would be used. There's a document that I've seen, which has been circulated to a few, but not all Nahant residents, um, which discusses uh, the idea that the new building would have about 4,600 square feet of teaching classrooms. And I think that number is not too inconsistent with the little bars on your chart, but you, you didn't have numbers for the, for the classrooms. I'd like to know that number. The FAQ say there are 45 to 60 students at MSC. So with that number, the square feet per student would be 76 to 102 square feet. That number is remarkable, even without including the classrooms in the other buildings. At MIT, we carry out teaching with about 20 square feet per student, and that number, 20, is in the range of industry standards in higher ed. With lab classes being more, maybe as much as 40, but seated classes typically being, being somewhat less. So remember, it's a dry building. So all the lab classes needing seawater would presumably be in the existing building. Does the Marine Science Center really need teaching facilities three or five times more posh than we have in my department at MIT? Or do they think they're going to increase the number of total students coming to Nahant to 200 or maybe 300? I mean, if so, they should tell us. Um, I don't know what else they might want to use the space for. There's a lot of information on the internet about things that Northeastern does elsewhere. And, um, you know, one of the things that they do, for example, in Burlington, is to talk about their unique results-driven partnership model, which is a place where non-university users can pay to use a 3D printing facility or use their drone testing cage. And at Burlington, pharmaceutical and biotech industry technicians and managers can also come and get hands-on training in short courses. I'm not saying that's what you have in mind here, but it is, if it is what you have in mind, whatever you have in mind for the MSC business model, we should have had a clear set of information long before this on the space, the people, and really what the focus is. And it should have been consistent. I, I can't view what happened with the FAQs and with the other information given out as sloppiness or, you know, or something like that. These weren't small errors. They weren't typos. It speaks volumes about the level of disrespect that's been shown to the citizens of this town. I'm I could say more, but I'm very grateful uh, to have been heard, and uh, I want to emphasize the numbers that I've quoted are not, uh, um, that are, are the best of my understandings, but need to be checked, and I really would hope to meet with Professor Trussell to discuss my statement and a few other concerns. I'm available any day next week. So a few words in closing. We have not gotten a clear evaluation of what this facility would mean for this town, maybe not even a factual one of its intent. I don't know. The FAQs have been not just sloppy, but disrespectful and misleading. And on this basis, our answer must be no expansion. Thank you. Does this work? Oh, it does. In the beginning, I had asked that Mike and then Jeff Musman speak, and then we'll go down the line, please, if it's okay. My name's Michael Manning. I live at 12 Fennel Way. I recommend that the selectmen give favorable consideration. It's not, I don't think this is. Is the mic working? Yeah. I just have to be a little closer. Like over and back, but I think one of the I recommend that the selectmen give favorable consideration to the options presented by the Northeastern Marine Science Center for the further development of their property. I consider Northeastern to be a good neighbor and a good corporate citizen. In his inaugural address, George H.W. Bush, the 41st President of the United States, said this, we cannot hope okay. only to leave our children okay. a bigger car and a bigger bank account. All right. 
we must we must hope to give them a sense of what it means to be a loyal friend a loving parent and a citizen who leaves his home his neighborhood and town better than he found it northeastern has done this in nahant the town of nahant was offered the land which Northeastern now owns in the early 1960s by the U.S. government who no longer needed the land for defense purposes. At the 1964 Nahant Annual Town Meeting, the assembled citizens considered Article 16 to appropriate $30,000 to acquire the property. The proposal had been considered and not recommended by the Board of Selectmen, the Advisory and Finance Committee, the Planning Board, and the Conservation Committee. Selectman Charles Kelly outlined the proposal. The initial purchase price was $30,000 based on a reduced valuation as parkland and would require additional expenditures, expenditures of $100,000 would be required to provide for public safety and to make the site then a former military facility safe for people to wander through. Access couldn't be restricted only to Nahanters. A development plan for a public park area would have to be funded and maintained. Questions and answers clarified that if the town did not vote to acquire the property, it would be offered first to other nonprofit, charitable, religious, and educational corporations, and then to private developers for residential development under the town's zoning bylaws and state building code for an estimated 24 single family homes on 30,000 square foot lots. Selectman Charles Kelly's summary was, the Board of Selectmen's opinion and the Advisory Board's opinion is that this is a luxury and an expense the town is not prepared to take on. The town meeting on a voice vote voted indefinite postponement, thereby passing on the offer. Northeastern University submitted a bid to acquire the property and build maintain and develop a marine science facility on June 16, 1965. The government gave a quick claim deed to Northeastern on February 23, 1966, conveying the land for a marine science facility and subject to terms and conditions for the next 20 years. On 16 July 1988, by written agreement, the United States issued a release acknowledging that the conditions of the deed had been met. Northeastern adopted Nahant as the home of its Marine Science Center, has rightfully purchased the property that the town declined, and has met for more than 50 years the requirements for use, development, and maintenance that have been set out by the U.S. government, the state constitution, Nahant bylaws, and common practice. Northeastern University supported SWIM, along with Polly Bradley, Norma Brooks, Charlotte Moore, and Bill Coffey. I was a founding member of SWIM, one of those who gathered spontaneously at the end of the EPA informational meeting in this town hall after EPA proposed allowing 301H waivers to permit discharge of primary sewage effluent from near shore coastal outfalls off Winthrop, Lynn, Swampscott, and Salem. Along with many other citizens of Nahant, we were fiercely and steadfastly supported by Ken Siebens, the director of the Marine Science Center, as well as Joseph Ayers, Patricia Morse, and other members of the Marine Science Center staff. The combined efforts of this volunteer committee ensured that SWIM and the HUNT and the Marine Science Center 
were successful in keeping the Hans waters clean and defeated the waiver proposals and ensured that federal, state, and local entities followed their own well-written laws that were in place to protect us all. Northeastern University has supported the community with educational assistance to the Johnson School students for over a decade, as well as college-age residents with a scholarship program instituted at the request of the selectmen and the school committee. In a myriad of ways, Northeastern has met the aspirations of our 41st president over the last 50 years by being a citizen who leaves his home, his neighborhood, and his town better than he found it. Moreover, Northeastern has indicated that it intends to continue the same into the future. I, for one, appreciate Northeastern's continuing efforts to support its neighbors, the town, and future generations as it plans to address the new issues in marine science and climate change. Thank you. Good evening. Is that working? <clears throat> Uh, my name is Jeff Mussman. I live at 15 Trimountain Road uh, here in Nahant. And uh, I rise to speak on behalf of the Nahant Preservation Trust and the Keep Nahant Wild movement, uh, which has been active in town on this issue. I'd, I'd like to, if I have to, reserve the right to get up later and speak uh, as a townsperson. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I, I really want to be sure that we are all refocused on the same thing and are not distracted by non-issues. I think I speak for many people in this room when I say this is not about opposition to science, not opposition to research, not opposition to education, or, or even the Marine Science Center as it was originally envisioned and for much of its life as it existed here in Nahant. Nor, frankly, is it, is it opposition to Northeastern University as an institution. The single issue we are confronting tonight is the unwarranted and overly aggressive expansion plans being proposed. This is, this is not about wetlands protection bylaws, don't be confused. This is about preserving the core of our being as a town, our history, our scenic beauty, our open space, our smallness. East Point embodies all of that. So <clears throat> had we been given the opportunity, we would have had a PowerPoint presentation and I'd like to go through that briefly. I'll, we've distributed a number of copies uh, to the extent you have them uh, follow along. To the extent you don't, I apologize. Uh, the first page is simply a couple of photographs of uh, East Point as we know it. And a second page shows how it feels facing west. All of this PowerPoint is, is really a preface uh, to what the statement that I will make later on. In, Mike Manning has uh, referenced some historical information. One thing that we point out here in this third slide is that the universe, when making their proposal to the United States government, the university made it clear that it seeks to acquire the whole of East Point in order to make it a wildlife preserve. Only in this way can the unusual literal and bentonic faunas be protected adequately. I hope I actually pronounce bentonic properly. We don't affect that. <coughs> oh, it could be just like that. The next page takes us all the way up to 1989. 
Bible says. With Nahat's first open space plan seeking to protect East Point. The plan recommended that the town take action to protect these areas as open space recreation, whether by establishing a special, special zoning classification or by placing conservation restrictions on East Point. The next year, 1990, Nahant adopted the special classification to prohibit development on East Point. Section 4.10B uses uh, delineate the uses that are permitted in a natural resource district. Wildlife management area, wildlife management areas, foot, bicycle, and a horse pass, wildlife and wetlands management programs, outdoor recreation, conservation of water, plant, and wildlife, etc. Open space plans and planning documents have consistently protected East Point from development. Northeastern University maintains much of the land as an undeveloped ecological study area from the 2000, uh, the 2000 open space plan. East, from the same plan, East Point is a vital resource, both as a natural habitat for wild plants and migrating birds in a passive recreation area for all the townspeople. We remind you that 1,700 Nahant residents signed a petition to preserve East Point. I read from it. Our goal is to preserve East Point as the conservation area it is today. East Point is jointly occupied by the Marine Science Center on land owned by Northeastern University and by the town of Nahant's Lodge Park. Natural beauty, geologic wonder, abundant wildlife, flora and fauna thrive in the exceptional environment and know no boundaries. This is what we seek to preserve. So we don't really understand why Northeastern has been given the opportunity to present various building expansion op uh, options today, or why the selectmen are meeting with them about the options. It is our view and the view of our zoning council and experts that the Nahant zoning bylaw, which has been in effect for 30 years, plainly prohibits any expansion by Northeastern. East Point is a natural resource district under our zoning bylaw. In a natural resource district, the only allowed uses and structures are recreational. This is consistent with the town's use of East Point for open space and recreation for the past three decades. It's also consistent with the town's open space planning and with Northeastern's own representations since the 1960s, half a century ago, that it would make East Point an ecological preserve if it were to acquire the property there. It is our view that the public has the right to use East Point for open space and recreation, and Northeastern has no legal right to build there. The so-called Dover Amendment does not trump Nahant's right to protect its natural resources. <laughs> Under decisions by the Massachusetts appellate courts, Northeastern University is subject to the natural resource protection requirements in the same way it is subject to wetlands protection requirements. The trust urges the town to direct its council to investigate the effect of the natural resource protection set forth in the zoning bylaw and to put on hold all expansion discussion pending a determination of this important legal issue. Thank you.
Okay. Let's see. Judy? Judy Zahora, 17 Simmons Road. I appreciate that Nahant, 50 years, uh, that Northeastern 50 years ago, purchased land so it wasn't developed. I appreciate that. But we understand that for the last 50 years, it's been a revenue generator for Northeastern. It's not like that there has been no money coming from that. So I don't think. Can you hear oh, sorry. the microphone? So for you the raise, last 50 years, it's. Raise that up. For the last 50 years, that should help. Um, for the last 50 years, it's been a revenue generator for Northeastern. It's not like for the last 50 years there's been no revenue coming in. So, I, I, so that's the point I want to make. And in 50 years' time, lots of things have changed. The world's changed a lot. But really, the question that I had is that you talked initially about a, a study, a traffic study in town, but I don't think I understood, or maybe I missed it, where you said how much traffic this was, additional traffic this was going to generate, how many cars are you going to park. So I didn't understand that. I also didn't understand how that was going to help our already deteriorating infrastructure. We already have problems with the sewers, we have problems with the water. So I can't understand how a 60,000 square foot building in any way occupied is going to help us with that. And I'd like to understand how that's going to be built in. Um, I do appreciate models. I do appreciate better views. I understand that. I'm grateful for that because in February, what you, the information that we were given was very poor. Very poor. So what I'd like to know, again, is infrastructure. How will, not, how will that support? What's, what's going to be the impact? I want to know the impact of traffic coming in and going out with the new building and the impact of, of the, um, the parking. Thank you. Jeff Thomas, 16 Little Nahant Road. Uh, first of all, thanks for that presentation. I learned a lot from it. And uh, there has been uh, mention of coastal zone management and storm surge. And that's what I would like to address. I've been doing some research on the Office of Coastal Zone Management website and uh, one, of the, one of the other ones, the, the national organization. And I discovered some storm surge maps that I think are relevant. Um, basically, it's not a really a matter of if, but when the Northeast Coast gets hit by a hurricane. We don't get them very often, but they do happen. So I want to point out that according to the storm surge maps, a category three storm will create a worst case storm surge of 18 feet, which will put about 75% of the area that you're talking about underwater. Um, you mentioned geothermal wells. You mentioned the, uh, the, the water treatment under the parking lot. And you mentioned, most importantly, I think, the mechanical facility of 11,000 square feet, all of which would be partially or completely below ground. Uh, in an 18-foot storm surge, I think they would be very much threatened, if not overwhelmed, by the, the seawater. Plus, you'd have probably most of the rocks on Canoe Beach, a whole lot of ocean wildlife, seaweed, and all kinds of debris strewn right across that flat plain. Uh, so in today's dollars, it could cost $10 million or more to fix that. Uh, the sea level is rising. We know that. It has been for several thousand years. It may start to rise faster. So. The next time we get a hurricane, then you have to rebuild it again. This, this is going to subject the town to all of the, you know, trucks and everything that have for construction. So aside from our concerns, I wonder, does it really make sense for Northeastern to locate a facility where it's going to get partially wiped out in a hurricane. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. It's totally clear. Mike 
Crawworth, 31 Summer Street. Um, I've long been a fan of the Marine Science Center, and uh, I, would, I would love to continue to be a fan of the Marine Science Center and of Northeastern's efforts. Uh, I will tell you that I remain highly skeptical of this project, largely for reasons that others have expressed here, uh, but with a pointed focus on the track record that's been documented uh, in, in Roxbury and Burlington of uh, Northeastern um, at least creating the impression in the minds of the local citizens of being uh, very disrespectful of their interests and expressed desires and attitudes, largely through the use of the Dover Amendment that Jeff described before. The Dover Amendment, for those who are not familiar, gives certain institutions, principally nonprofits, the ability to, uh, or at least the, the alleged ability, to bypass or transcend local zoning requirements. And that is what I understand was done by Northeastern in the instances I described, Roxbury and Burlington. I don't have details about that, but that's my understanding. And that's been the, the reason for the adverse reaction of those citizens. Um, I will say that I am also impressed by what was presented here. I think it reflects a lot of effort being put into uh, the, the presentation, and I commend Northeastern for that. I will suggest that if a presentation like this had been done at the outset of this project, then you would have probably encountered far less opposition and had much better opportunity to come to a soft landing with this project. However, we are where we are. And I, I do um, respect the attitude that's been portrayed of um, working together, uh, good neighborliness, uh, good fellowship, good faith. Uh, and so I'd like to make a, um, a, a call upon Northeastern. Uh, Jeff may be right that the Dover Amendment does not assist Northeastern in what it's meaning to do, but let's just take that off the table. So my proposal is that Northeastern demonstrate its professed good faith by here and now professing that it will waive all reliance on the Dover Amendment and make itself subject to the zoning bylaws of the, state, of the community of Nahant as any other institution that was not in its position would have to do. Thank you. I'm Judy Walsh. I live at 33 High Street. At the beginning of Northeastern's presentation, we were told that um, 7,900 cars a day pass into Nahant as far as the tide. So obviously that must be beach traffic because if the rest, if, the, if well, who goes there if, if the rest, if the cars that only get as far as Town Hall are 1,700. So if it's 1,700 into town and 1,700 out of town, that's 850 cars a day. And if the 170 that you said goes onto your property, is 85, then we're talking not 2%, as you said, but 10% of the traffic into Nahant and out every day. I, I, can, I can divide, Stop Stop I, can, I can easily divide 1,700 by 170. Can, can I just clarify for you, sure. Ms. Walsh? Um, so this survey was done, uh, is this working? No. no. She yelled, Jeff. Okay, um, so I don't like yelling, though. Um, so this survey was done. Well, I'm, that's a long way for me to go, and I'm fat. I can't fit through. They won't hear you. There you go. The sorry. Um, the survey was done on November seventh and November eighth, um, and we've committed to doing two more additional surveys in the in the, in the upcoming months. Um, by our calculations, and, and the town has the data, the data can be shared with everybody so that everyone can see all the data. Um, our calculations indicate that of the traffic crossing over the causeway at tides, which where, is where one sensor was, the traffic that ultimately ends up in the Marine Science Center is 
The traffic that passes town hall, we represent 10% of that traffic. That's right. Okay. But that's not what we were told at the beginning of the no, presentation. No, that, that is what exactly. So my concern is, is that you were presenting the number of 2% in a way that, uh, as, as if that was what all of your traffic represents. And it was disingenuous to present it that way. And that makes me very concerned about everything else you tell us. And that's all. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Perfect debate. Perfect debate. It's going to be perfect. Does this work now? Hi, I'm Angela Monroe. Uh, I live at 15 Simmons Road. I was raised in Nahant and moved back here to town with my family about five and a half years ago. I'm also a Northeastern graduate. I graduated from the law school in 2008. My husband graduated from the law school in 2004. We both chose Northeastern because of its cooperative learning program that fostered collaboration over competition, which is rather unique for a law school. We both became public interest lawyers in large part because of our Northeastern experiences. So I come at this issue with an appreciation for Northeastern and what it has stood for. This expansion project feels antithetical to Northeastern's philosophy as an educational institution and what for me made it a great place to study. The scale of the proposed expansion will overwhelm the infrastructure of our small town. One of the handouts that was made available at the entrance is a graph, and it looks at 14 different university marine science centers along the East Coast, I believe from Maine to Maryland. Uh, one side of the graph lists the size of the marine science center in square feet. The other side lists the size of the host town in square miles. Nahant is one square mile of land about Northeastern University currently has about 33,000 square feet of building on their campus. The proposed expansion increases that to about 88,000 square feet. On the chart, the average is about 7,400 square feet of buildings for one square mile of land. So this proposed expansion will be up more than 10 times that average. And as a Nahant resident and very proud Northeastern graduate, it's still not clear to me why the size of the proposed expansion is so out of proportion to the size of our small town. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Carl Jenkins, uh, 339 Nahant Road, soon to be known as the Northeastern Turnpike. I'm not here to discuss the buildings. Uh, others have done so and will continue to do so, I'm sure. But I am here to talk about Nahant and its residents. The residents are treated as if they have nothing to say, and the leadership has nothing to learn uh, from us, despite the incredible depth of knowledge and experience our residents possess. From engineering to finance, science to law, environmental expertise to fishing, no one has been brought into the discussion or were asked to advise in the process. In fact, the committee that was put together to do just that was dismissed before it even began. Um, now many are being told that we have no choice, that, NU, that Northeastern will build, um, but that they will pay us some money and we should take the money and run um, as a solution and as a great benefit uh, in lieu of the construction. Um, but before we do that, um, I ask this. How many lobstermen uh, have been approached uh, to analyze the outflow pipe solution? How many engineers uh, have been approached to speak to address the infrastructure uh, issues? How many lawyers were requested uh, to provide support to help identify legal options or alternatives? How many environmental experts, and these are all from town, were asked to provide opinions regarding the impact of changes at East Point? How many financial experts were asked uh, to help find financial alternatives? Uh, in my opinion, it's wholly irresponsible that no one uh, with the needed expertise from town was involved in analyzing such a momentous town-changing decision without such advice. Incredibly, many residents have offered to assist in many ways um, and have been rebuffed. 
But rather than investigate options, we are being told that nothing can be done. I believe this was the same language used about the golf course, the Valley Road School, and the Life Saving Station. We were told by many, including people who are speaking tonight, uh, that they could not be saved either. Thank goodness the rest of us didn't listen to them then and now, and we shouldn't listen to them now. What we can all expect to hear soon is, never mind the buildings and the effects of the town, but how Northeastern will save us from financial ruin by providing us with payments in lieu of taxes. Now let's discuss reality. Rarely has any municipality balanced their books on payments in lieu of tax payments, um, and there are several reasons why. Um, uh, and specifically in the haunt, we know, despite some of the studies we've heard, traffic will increase. And it's not just from students, but from employees, vendors, visitors, conference attendees, tours, and other types uh, of event attendees, which means more wear and tear on roads and infrastructure. Water and sewer use will be up, uh, putting more pressure again on infrastructure. Crime and traffic violations will be up, putting more pressure on our police department. More trash on our beaches and roads will have to be picked up as those who don't live here will have less concern for how it looks. More calls to the fire department and more specialized equipment will be required, again putting pressure on budgets and facilities. Additional pressure on our tax base as there will be pricing pressure on the resale of our homes which could cause a, a, actually a drop in tax revenue. So where, so where do we end up? The money that we will get will be spent on things that are required by the end of Northeastern expansion and not for the benefit of town residents. Worse, in the not too distant future, when the initial payment is gone and we will again go looking to Northeastern for help. They, they have been here for 50 years and haven't put anything towards the town other than a few half scholarships which cost them nothing. Once the structure is built, they have no need to keep us happy. As we all know, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. It is, it is the selling of the soul of this wonderful town for promises of a few dollars that will not solve our financial issues and will ruin a gem of research, resource and turn us into a company town. Finally, this is also about our kids, the town, and our, and our legacy of the leaders. This is the determining factor that changes this town forever. For the sake of this town and the wonderful people who live in it, do not sell us out. Thank you. Julie Tarmy, 3440 Steps Lane. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking the town administrator, the selectmen, the Northeastern representatives, and everyone from coming out tonight. Um, I wish that we had had uh, an event like this years ago to show people in town just how important it is to show up at all of these meetings, not just for Northeastern, but for all of the meetings, town meeting, I'd love to see it overflowing like this. I have heard so many things tonight that I feel like my emotions are slinky. Sometimes I'm over here, sometimes I'm over there. But thankfully, eventually I lined up in the middle, and the middle is Nahant. This summer, I gave a lecture on behalf of the Nahant Historical Society on the history of that beautiful piece of land up there. And I talked about how many times it has been changed over the last thousand years. You want to start with our Native Americans and then go to Thorwald, who is reported to have visited Nahant, and then work your way up to the early inhabitants, uh, the cow pasture, the sheep grazing land. Then we move into the uh, summer resorts, uh, the big hotels, and the small cottages that now adorn a lot of Nahant. The military came in and they changed the landscape of that point of land drastically. If you look at the, at the pictures of Nahant from 200 years ago, you'll notice that it's far uh, lower to the ocean than it stands now. So we have the military to thank for the height that is there, as well as the big dig, which figged in, filled in the uh, missile silos, which is now Lodge Park. I remember as a child 
sneaking up there after the military had left, but before the silos were gone, and it was all concrete and metal. But big dig, filled it in, and again, we've been raised up. It's been chopped down, it's been, it's been dug up, it's been filled in, it's been changed. And the point I tried to make at my lecture was, it's still beautiful. Northeastern has been there for 50 years, and it is still beautiful. Is it going to change drastically with the addition of this building? I don't think so. I think that copse of trees, which is the Murphy Bunker, is still going to look like a copse of trees, only you're going to see that cement line from above. So if I've got my drone going, then yes, I'll see it. But from both sides, Lodge Park and coming in through the front gate, I won't see the change. Does that mean that, there's my slinky, do I want it? I don't know. But I am not against listening to Northeastern present what they want to do there. With the passing of the new wetlands bylaw, my house, which is at a very high elevation, is now in the buffer zone. I know that that sea is rising. I see it every day when I walk down to the Historical Society. And on a beautiful day where there's no storm, but you've got a breeze, the waves are coming up over on Tudor Beach Wall. So I know the sea is rising. Is this something that Northeastern's facility is going to help us learn about and study? And can we stop it? Mm, it's Mother Nature. Mother Nature's going to wind up taking what she wants to take, but at least we might be able to look at what's causing it. What's causing that sea to rise? I am not against Northeastern progressing. I appreciate the man hours that have gone into developing these plans. I also appreciate the man hours and the money that has been put in by Nahant Preservation Trust and Keep Nahant Wild to bring this discussion. Pete Rogers said it so eloquently. I can't, I can't repeat what he said, but we need to figure out how we can come together, come to an understanding, I don't see how we can stop Northeastern from building where they own the land. I don't understand, I'm not a lawyer, I don't understand how it all works, but I know that if I wanted to build up on my house, I, of course I wouldn't be able to, it's already too tall, but if I had a smaller house, if I lived in my neighbor's house and I wanted to build up, I want to know that I can do that. I own the building as long as I follow the rules and regulations. I should be able to do that. I'm in a hot, born and bred. I love this beautiful town. I work diligently to preserve, protect, and share the history of this town. And I don't want that history to turn gray. I don't want it to to turn nasty and we keep it all and we will share all of the history everything that happens we keep I tell this to the school children we have I'll, I'll wrap it up I knew I was going to do this um, I tell this to the school children what you say and what you write to your friends we keep so if that's how you want to be remembered in a hundred or two hundred years when your grandchildren and great-grandchildren come down to find out what you were like in 2018 and we say this is it or my great-grandchild might say this is it is your great-grandchildren children going to be proud of you or are they going to say whoa dude disrespect so thank you just think of it stay keep that slinky in the middle stay level-headed and thank you for your presentation. Bye. My name is Ruthie Merrill. I live on 71 Lenox in Little Nahunt. Um, first of all, I want to make sure, kind of say what Abel says. It's not an anti-Northeast 
opinion I have. I've been excited to live here for three years from Missouri to learn about the coastal environment from Northeast's public talks that they welcome us to. Um, I just can't get over in my head, and I'm really asking you, um, Mr. Frank, I, I mean, I don't remember your last name, what are you going to, what, in really good faith, and the scientists that are on the planning committee, does it make sense to take green space when green space is so critical in our nation, much less a mile big town to make another building when there you have so many other options. This was presented as a dry building, so it doesn't make any sense to me, except for that you own it, that you would go ahead and take away that land and give us, um, that's the best place to watch const constellations in the summer is there. What's going to happen to light, you know, light pollution in the, in the night? Are you going to turn off all electric from sundown to sunrise? I can't picture that. That is just a very much of an important gem in, in, in our whole world. And we don't have much green space. I just can't get my head around why responsible scientists would even want to develop on that green space. To the, to the selectmen, to the selectmen, I appreciate all your effort to try and build some bridges, and I appreciate y'all too for your building of bridges. But I just have to say, I don't get it. I just don't get it. So when you're voting on this, I just want to say I don't get it. Uh, my name is Dan Perpelitzer for Castle Terrace, Nahant. Um, first thing, I didn't think, and I'm quite sad by it, that Washington has come to this town. That we have become a town where everything is black and white. It was fine during the Revolution. It was fine during the Civil War, during World War I, World War II, Korea. But it's a little different. We're not using guns now. We're trying to use our minds, and they are getting whopped, I feel, by emotions which are drifting from the facts, the reality of what we're dealing with. I, I dress, I, all of you, I'd like you to look at what was passed out by Nahant Preservation Trust and Wild Nahant. The photographs, very interesting photographs. You can see it up there, Lodge Park. For three and a half years, I worked at Lodge Park, bringing back the ocean views. This goes back to when Mark Cullinane was selectman, so that, that's a few years now. If you look at the photograph up there, you'll notice what looks like an anchor. If you go out towards Gloucester, you see that end, that's, I don't know what that might be, the northeast, the northeast end, you'll see the curve. And then you see a line going down Lodge Park, and then you see something here which looks like an enormous circle. That's Nahant property. The town of Nahant has not, has not, has not followed its own conservation code for that park. So when I hear everyone saying, oh, it's a wild space, we have systematically ignored what was given to us, something that we own. So when you tell Northeastern, you, you talk about Northeastern in black and white terms, if you go down to the valley, you know, the, the field, for years, when I was working up there, for, I think for four years, Northeastern had a graduate student who was doing work with bees. We are in a, a unique ecosystem which involves the Boston Harbor Islands, Nahant, Deer Island, Hull. And there were an incredible variety of bees. This was on Northeastern's property. So the few of you who ever go up there, and very few ever do, you'll notice, that if you remember years ago, there were all these little flags all over the place. They, well, they were marking things. But this, this set of photographs that they're showing you they were taken in the middle of Lodge Park 
where the town has not tried to follow the open space guideline, which is to have that be a meadow. You have plenty of places that are lawn moored. What you're looking at right now, and be real clear about this, this is in fact fact. This is a dead zone. When you have a lawn, you have a dead zone. In our lodge park, there's, a, there's a, uh, two big circles. You know what those circles are used for? Those circles are used for the sheriff's office and the environmental police and the state police to go up there and have lunch. I know. I worked up there for three and a half years. Do you see the line down the middle that, that creates the shaft for the anchor? What that is, is essentially uh, a 30-foot road. For what purpose? That was supposed to be a meadow for birds, for insects, for wild plants. We're talking about often, you, you talk a lot about Northeasterners threatening our environment, threatening our environment. The sad reality, because often we like to follow the, the advertising rather than the facts. The sad reality, this community has been threatened by only one organization, and that was Nahant Preservation Trust, when they got the Coast Guard station, excuse me, I would, they were in negotiate, they wanted to have a function hall so the Kardashian girls all over the Northeast would come down. You, you can criticize, oh yes, that, that's perfectly fine, perfectly fine. But the reality was, the Nahant Preservation Trust was in violation of the state coastal bylaws for dune protection and for what they wanted to do, what their architect had designed. They eventually, and what you see today, is essentially what has been there since pretty much 20 years ago, because they could not do it. The state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, said no. And that's what my point is. The point is very clear. The point is very clear. You have a set of pictures that tell you Northeastern's going to be this horrible neighbor. I'm not sure what Northeastern's going to be. Certainly in February, they were awful. There's no question about that in anyone's mind in this room. Northeastern showed that they were arrogant, not willing to listen, and if we had listened to our selectmen, my, the selectmen before that date had been trying to meet with Northeastern, and they couldn't. And everyone is always, oh, again, we seem to have fallen into this black and white thinking on Northeastern. Well, I, 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 Mr. Chairman, I meet my time. One minute. One minute, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a, a former speaker said that uh, there's a date in here, um, Northeastern, uh, oh, in 1960 wanted to acquire all of Lodge Park. Well, they did not. So what, what does that say to you? That says, oh, Northeastern is this big bad boy. I don't know if they are or not. But what I'm saying is we're being set up with black and white images by the people who are opposed to Northeastern, and maybe at the end of the day, I'll be opposed to Northeastern too. But right now, I'm interested in what they have come forward with. There seems to be another set of a compromise developing here, possibly. And I just hope we aren't so arrogant that we turn our back on something that really could be very good for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Sachs. I'm from Burlington. And I'd like to speak from up there. I want to speak from up here because I want to speak to you guys, also to the selectmen, because I know there is absolutely no point in my speaking to Northeastern. Uh, we lost in Burlington. We didn't have, what is this, two, three hundred people. At the meetings we had with our uh, planning board, we had maybe 10 people of which about four spoke because our park, Mary Cummings Park, 
was unknown to the community. Even today, people say, where is that place? So in a sense, the Friends of Mary Cummings Park utterly failed in our mission to make that park a fabric of everyday life. We prevented Boston from selling it to developers. It never occurred to us that Northeastern was going to create a major development inside the park. Similar thing, there's a park that surrounds what was an Air Force base. Boston was derelict and didn't take the space back from the Air Force. Northeastern bought it and they built a quiet little campus and then a couple of years ago they decided to go crazy and they did and there was absolutely nothing we could do to stop it. The selectmen, and, uh, not the selectmen, the planning board, all but one member spoke strongly against what they were doing and they all voted for it because after lengthy discussion with town council because of the Dover amendment they felt they had absolutely no choice. We could have presented them from building a building that was taller than our largest fire engine, because that would be safety. But other than that, we could do absolutely nothing. I want to read you three quotes from uh, Kathy Spiegelman that are on video. They're public knowledge. If you, you can find them at the Burlington BCAT site, or you can actually find them on the Mary Cummings Park site. We very much respect and appreciate the fact that we have a campus that is located in a very special place surrounded by a very special park. Because we absolutely respect the fact that we are in a very special location. These are three quotes that all took place within about three minutes of speaking. We understand that we are asking for permission to build in a very special area. What I would say to you guys is, be very, very careful, okay? They showed you architects' renderings that made it look pretty good. I'm sitting in my seat saying, oh, the heck with it. It's fine. It's fine. Right? It's really not that big a deal. You can barely see it. That's according to the renderings. I will have you know that in Burlington, they never did any renderings of what their buildings would look like from the park, ever. I created them myself and held them up in a meeting. It was very disturbing. And let me say that the actual buildings look worse than my renderings. <laughs> let me show you some pictures. You've seen these before, guys. You're going to love them. This meadow, remember this? This was, we have very little open space in Burlington. Very little. The whole town was built up after World War II. Very little open space. This view was one of the most beautiful views in town. And the trustees of reservations are about to take over park management, but they haven't raised the money they need yet, so they're on hold. Once the trustees take over the park, it will become extremely popular, and what Northeastern did would have been resulted in this many people in pitchforks and so forth. But they managed to get their buildings built before the trustees did anything. This view, sorry, I have a smaller printer. Yeah, it looks a little bad because it's under construction, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to look a lot worse when it's done. What we got out of them was a promise. They made a slight change in the entry to the park, which I told them I thought actually made it worse and was a further desecration of the park, but they didn't listen. They didn't care. They agreed to plant trees to hide the building because now we're talking about two things over there. We're talking about a drone cage, which is the most unsightly thing. And it was built at the very highest point of Mary Cummings Park. It is visible from nearly every part of the park that's not in, actually in the woods. And next to it is a 70, 69 foot, let me not exaggerate, 69 foot, 60,000 square foot office research park. Okay. You can see this stuff from everywhere. So this meadow that you just saw has been desecrated permanently. 
Now you put trees around it, we know that they can't put in tall trees because it's too expensive. They're going to plant small trees and they won't be evergreens. And by the time they're old enough, uh, tall enough to hide that building, I'll be dead. <laughs> it's terribly sad. And I will tell you that they could have done it differently. They could have done that building differently. They could have moved it down the hill. And the reason they didn't was it was cheaper. They came to Burlington with that building completely planned, and they told everybody, this must happen. A little bit of national security thrown in on top. Defense money coming in to destroy our little park. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is, be very, very careful. They showed you the very best architectural renderings. I wonder what it's really going to look like. We went out and took balloons to the height of the building, took pictures and went back to Photoshop to mock up what it would really look like, which they had never done until I did it. And the real buildings look worse than my mock-ups. I did not exaggerate. You have a beautiful field of wildflowers completely dominated by a drone cage and an office research park. Forever. It's there forever. I don't know. So what I'm telling you is, if she can say, we, very, we understand that we're asking permission to build in a very special area, I think you guys have a special area. What this demonstrates is they don't care. They have a job. These are good people. I'm sure they're good people. But they have a job, and their job is to put the damn thing in. And they treated you like they treated Burlington. But in Burlington, they really didn't have to back up and give us A, B, and C. They just told us off the record, we don't really care. One more minute, John, please. We're going to put it in because of the Dover Amendment. And the only reason we're mucking around with your public meetings is to try to not make enemies. That's what I was told in private by somebody on their team, okay? So be very, very careful. It may be fine. What the architect showed may be fine, and maybe they're not gonna bring in that many people, but maybe it's really not gonna look like that, and maybe they're gonna bring in a lot of people. Because they're not, they never told us what's gonna go on in the research building. That's secret, that's government stuff. They assured the military that this was a safe campus. So they're not telling you what's going on in there either. I would be extremely careful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Mahoney, 179 Willow Road. Uh, I've lived in Nahant my whole life. Um, I'm a lobsterman. I go by East Point every day. Pulled my uh, boat out last week. Now I walk up East Point every day. Um, it's beautiful. My kids, we grew up on Vernon Street. They played over there every, you know, all summer long, rode their bikes up there. It's a beautiful uh, place. One of the boys worked for Northeastern. And, you know, Northeastern people are great, nice people. Um, the PR people, I might have a problem with, though, today. Uh, I got this in the mail. This is a copy of the uh, flyer that went out uh, that Northeastern sent this week, one of the five they've sent over the uh, past year. And there's been a lot of questionable items, just as John said, be careful. The PR people, because I, I like Jeff. We talked about football the day we came out and looked at a place together and you know we both like football mm -hmm. etc so I trust you so I don't think you did this okay yes. but someone wrote in collaboration with Nahant Lobsterman the university will build and operate a hatchery that will ultimately provide 100,000 stage 4 lobsters mm -hmm. per year at the Nahant fishery um, we talked about that that day and I told you, and I brought you out there because I want you to see how beautiful it is from the ocean, by the way. And then we were going to go over to Lynn. I was going to show you 
We have the options in Linwood, by the way. We ran too. out of time for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm kind of I'm kind of upset. Yeah. I don't want it to be you because I kind of like you, but I, I don't like, like people too. misrepresenting us. Okay. Yeah. We were the guys who stood out there a year ago uh, and got people to come to the first uh, the MEPA meeting. We then got people to come up here fe last February, and you know, we're against expansion at Northeastern, okay? Right. Yep. And we, we continue to be after the three uh, pre presentations. But I want everybody here who, read, who got this thing in the mail this week to know the lobstermen uh, are not in collaboration with Northeastern. You, we, we, you got our views, you saw us, saw us right. roll, roll our eyes. Yeah. And we know stage one, two, and three lobsters get churned up by the pipes that you, you suck the water out. Right. That wasn't mentioned here either. That's right. So, okay, maybe it's a, a zero sum situation with the, with the hatchery and your PR people are, you know, throwing us a crumb. But believe me, uh, the, the fishermen to a person are not in collaboration. I checked with everybody today. You know, you did talk to a few of us, but nobody's in collaboration. Thanks. Um, hello, Bill. I, I just want to make sure, uh, Mr. Mahoney, Bill, I just want to make sure that uh, I address you because we do uh, have a relationship. I'm sorry that it's interpreted that those words in collaboration suggest that the lobstermen are in favor of this project. What is meant by that is that assuming this project were to go, go forward and we build the hatchery, we need to work with the lobstermen to get buried females. And we need to work with the lobstermen to understand where the best place to put the lobsters that we grow up would be. So that's what's meant by collaborating with the lobstermen. Um, I won't mention any names. You know that I've spoken with certain individuals and said, here's what we're willing to do on the seawater system. We're cutting from 2,400 GPM down to 600 GPM. We're, yeah, absolutely, at your suggestion. You guys made great suggestions, and we've benefited greatly from them. So you get, ton, you get all the credit for that. But we're cutting from 2,400 to 600 GPM. We're building a subsurface discharge system. The intake velocities and slot velocities are well below uh, uh, what's required by DEP and EPA. And in terms of the plan for the hatchery, as, as we discussed, we know that if we pump at, a, at our originally proposed 2,400 GPM at peak times when lobster larvae are in the, in the water column, that on average in a year, we would take out 100,000 stage one to stage three lobsters. Now we know that about 0.02 to 0.04% eggs make it to market size, right? Well, the, the, that's just, we're, we're just made those calculations based on the best available data. We're now cutting to 600 GPM, so based on the same calculations, we're looking at about 25,000 stage one through stage three uh, larvae eggs being macerated, taken out of the system. What we're proposing is building a hatchery that would put 100,000 stage four lobsters in the hot waters, all of whom have a 0.05% survivorship rate, which is literally orders of magnitude more than stage one through three. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Is that, that I just, Josh, come on, Josh, 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 Josh. Josh. With all due respect, I, with all due respect, I'm not going to get into this. I never said that. I, ne I never said that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mahoney. I, 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 if this hatchery is built, I will operate it indefinitely. Fair enough. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Okay. Hello, my name is Luke Conlin. I'm at 72 Spring Road. I grew up in Nahant. I love Nahant. Uh, I've been a fan of Northeastern over the years. Uh, I've gone to a lot of the science talks up there, which are great. And I used to help out at the telescope, which was up there, the East Point Solar Observatory. That was up there till last year. Um, I'm a professor of physics over at Salem State, so I, I respect science. And, uh, but I just came up to ask one question because uh, I can't seem to find a good answer anywhere, which is what exactly are the sources of funding for the project? Like, are they federal grants? Are they 
private donations? Are they university funds? What mixture of those things are there? If they're federal funds, what kind of federal funds are there? Um, so I'm, I'd, I'd really like to know what the sources of funding are. One reason I'd like to know is Northeastern has said you'd like to, to figure out like how to change your reputation as a bad neighbor and like what counts as a good neighbor. I think part of the perception is that you're not already you're already not paying your fair share of your like to cover your impact on the town, um, and so people are naturally worried about like adding new people and new um, infrastructure and how that's going to impact the town. So I'm wondering what your sources of funding are, how much are they, and um, are there any is there any room for say uh, a yearly offset of um, to to offset the infrastructure impact that's somehow proportional to the impact based on number of people or um, the size of the building, that sort of thing. We will address that question as part of our overall response to the concerns that have been raised. Thank you. Great. Um, B. Rogers. Uh, B. Rogers, 44 Pearl Road, Nahant. Um, I do not have prepared remarks. I came here because um, I thought that the purpose of this meeting was to hear what the Northeastern building plans were and how they'd been modified after the response to the presentation in February. I think that the changes and the presentation that we've just seen have really been remarkable. And I think there are a couple of points that, that are worth making, but what I'm reassured is that you will have an opportunity to respond because there, there were more opinions than questions. And I think I'd like to hear some of the responses that you have to the questions that were raised um, having to do with have you consulted different kinds of um, people concerned with environmental impact, what are the legal ramifications and so on and so forth, but I've also heard some very conflicting uh, things about we're not here, despite some of the comments, we are not here to vote. We are here to listen and find out what the, what the new plans are and what the impact will be. The figure of 60,000 square feet includes HVAC and thermal wells and a lot of stuff that's not going to house people. So some of those numbers, um, it looked like the usable space was more in the 33,000 um, area. And even then, it would be nice to hear what, what the spaces are, what the labs are. Are they wet, dry, computer? Um, what, uh, what kinds of impact evaluations have been done? But I have to say that compared to the presentation, to what we saw, that the responses that I'm seeing to the concerns that ha were expressed at that time and since are, are really quite remarkable. So I'm hoping to hear also, I heard a very definitive statement that Northeastern owns the property and can build within restrictions of uh, environment and so on. I've heard an equally firm statement that no, it can't. Um, and I'd like a little guidance about who and on what basis are the decisions being made. My name is Jim Walsh. Uh, I live at 33 High Street. I've lived in Nahant uh, since 1973. Uh, I drove across the causeway uh, at night. I had never seen the haunt before in my life. I woke up the next morning, looked around, and said, I'm staying here for the rest of my life. And I think that was a good decision. I just want to say that I support Northeastern, uh, Northeastern University. I support them. I support their efforts in science, in marine science, in climatology, and also in the humanities and all the other things that they do. But I do not support their doing most of that in the hunt. They don't have to. I 
I appreciate the attempts that they've made to modify their designs. I think they were very well done. Although I still have to ask my friend from Marblehead, the architect, uh, you know, if, if they were building in Old Town in Marblehead, which side would he be on? I, I, I have my doubts. But I also noticed the, the, the PR element of this. When we first started to talk about this, it was the Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative. If you look at all the PR that they, they put out on the internet in their uh, filings, it's the Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative. Well, now if we look up here, all of a sudden it's the Coastal Sustainability Institute. Okay, what happened to the urban? But we, they've also said, well, what we're talking about is the Marine Science Center. They're not talking about the Marine Science Center. Marginally, tangentially they are, but they're not. They're bringing in something that is entirely new, that is actually, as I wrote in the Lynn item seven months ago, it's a wonderful idea, I think, intellectually, to bring people, diverse people to come, be near each other, uh, solve problems in creative ways. It's a wonderful idea. But they don't have to do it in Nahant. They don't have to do it here. The other problem is trustworthiness. People have become aware of the situation in Roxbury Crossing, where after a year and a half of negotiations, they came to a, an agreement with the community. They're going to build an eight-floor eight, uh, dormitory. Until the last minute, everything changed. They said, oh, never mind that. We're going to build 22 stories. You had your say. You participated, we listened, but we're going to put up 22 stories instead of the ones we negotiated. So we have a problem with trustworthiness. Our selectmen, I think, I'm interpreting this, I think that they see an opportunity to have Northeastern solve some of our financial problems. And it looks like we're going to be facing them. Well. I don't think that they should do that. I think if we think back to our experience as a community, we woke up in the 1990s owing a tremendous amount of money to the state of, of uh, Massachusetts because some incompetent person had made an error and all of a sudden we were, we were flooded with debt. So what did we do? We got together as a community we reduced costs, and we ultimately dug ourselves right out of that problem and started to build, again, the beautiful community that we live in. We don't need Northeastern. We're not going to sell to Northeastern our beauty, our culture, our town for a few pieces of silver. And then, <laughs> and then people are saying, we can't possibly beat a billion dollar corporation. How can we do that? We're the smallest town in Massachusetts. We're one square mile. They're a billion dollar corporation. How can we beat them? Well, they said that about David and Goliath, didn't he? Who won that one? David won. Remember the the Spanish Armada and the, that little English fleet, which one was going to win? The Spanish Armada? They didn't. We can work together, fund the proper legal representation that we need, and I think we can make Northeastern understand that they cannot do what they want to do. And I think we should give them a round of applause as they leave town with this, pro this uh, project. Say thank you very much. Thank you very much. We love our marine science. Even though Joe Ayers doesn't love me anymore, I still love him. Uh, 
the, we, we have fought battles. We've been on the same side. We fought the MWRA, and we won. Here we are again. We can fight, and we can win, and I hope we do. Thanks. See if I can put this back in. Hi, Sue Jolian, one fen away um, here in lovely Nahant. And first of all, I want to say I do have a lot of things in common with you from those of you who are here from Northeastern. I didn't have the pleasure of growing up in this town. I've actually been here 16 years as of this month, but it's easy to fall in love with Nahant. And like you, I'm a researcher. My field is science. You work in marine science, I work in medical research. Um, we both face a lot of controversies with what we do. Some people say, why are you doing this? Do you need to do this? I face that all the time. But what I want to bring up tonight is a topic that we've kind of touched on, but it's definitely more nebulous. It's the topic of ethics. And within medical research, the things that I do have to go through ethical review boards before we even begin. We hold people's lives in our hands. And our goal is to have the lightest footprint possible. When I say that, I mean we want to have as minimal impact on people with achieving the most scientific research that we can do. And I've seen excellent projects that have had to be shelved because they were going to do more harm than good. And it kind of struck me today. I went and grabbed my book on ethics, this entire book, which will put anybody to sleep because it is not a page turner reminds you, reminds me, of why I do this every day. I have dedicated 20 years of my life to bringing better science to the general population. And I always ask myself, whenever I'm doing a new project, would I do this to myself? Would I be a subject in this? Would I do this with my mother, with my brother? The answer is no. I remove myself from it. And at times, I've had to do that. And I was thinking more about this as a larger concept today with this meeting happening today. And I was thinking, hmm, I don't know what the ethics are for marine science. I'm not a marine scientist, so I don't know the rules. I was thinking back to that petition that Northeastern received from 1,700 signatures from Nahant. Did a quick little research on our census. We have about 3,400 people. And with 1,700 signatures, that actually represents about 60% of our voting population in the town, give or take a little bit, because my census numbers are from 2010. So 60%, which is basically the ethics board of Nahant, saying we don't want this. Nobody's against science. We're willing to listen. I appreciate everything that you've put together for us tonight. It's been really helpful to see this. But I'm still thinking of the ethics of it. And believe it or not, it brought me back to Dr. Seuss, the Lorax. And I'm sure everybody's read the Lorax, but for anybody who isn't familiar with the Lorax, it is about the Wunzler, who finds this beautiful paradise and decides that it's great, these gorgeous trees, these animals, these birds, these fish, wonderful. What harm is it if I cut down one tree? And as soon as the Wunzler comes and cuts down a tree, the Lorax comes out to say, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees, and begs the Wunzler not to do this. The Wunzler doesn't listen and continues, and the animals leave, and the Lorax comes back to the Wunzler. I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. The Wunzler doesn't listen, and the birds are gone. Lorax comes back again. I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. The Wunzler doesn't listen. The Wunzler never had any malintent, but at the end, Everything is gone. Everything is lost. So last thing on our ethics committee, with the 60% of the voters, I would like to say, we are the Lorax. We speak for the trees. We speak for the birds, and we speak for the bees. We speak for the ocean and all of the fish. We speak for East Point. How about you? Thank you. Marilyn Mahoney, I live at 179 Willow Road. I am part of the lobstering Mahoney family who um, actually represents almost half of the lobstermen in this community. 
Um, I'm going to try to focus on something positive. One day I went and spoke to a group of Nahant people. Some of them were multi-generational families. Some were brand new people. Some rented, some bought property. And I asked for a brainstorming session of what Nahant means to these people. And the responses were things like heaven on earth, jewel in the crown, hidden, um, let me put my glasses on, I'm an educator like all of you and have lost my eyesight so I need my eyeballs, hidden gem of the North Shore, utopia, peaceful, tranquil, undiscovered, off the radar, paradise. Tonight, I would like all the Haunt residents, I mean, I really wish if we could go wiggle our noses and go back in time and speak to our forefathers that made the decision to let go of this beautiful place in our midst that we are all so fortunate to live amongst, this beautiful piece of property. If, the, if our forefathers knew then what we know now, about Northeastern's ambition to become this global university. And I'm not adverse to your vision. I think it's admirable and something worth pursuing. But Nahant, of the 351 communities in the state of Massachusetts, is the smallest. There's one way in and one way out. I read over all five of your publications that you sent out and the numbers of students projected changed. It went from 111 up to 147, I believe, and I heard the other evening it was going up to 254. That means that there's going to be all of this traffic coming in and out of our town. I think your vision is too big for the smallest community in Massachusetts. I say to the, uh, my fellow Nahanters, please, let's not make another mistake. At this moment in our history, we all have to stop and ask ourselves, what will be our legacy? I know I, for one, do not want my children, hopefully someday my future grandchildren, questioning my judgment. I do not want the sign at the other end of the causeway saying, entering Nahant home of Northeastern North. All of you should be aware that if a professor start buying property over here, we're going to turn into a college town. If the university itself buys property here, we lose taxes. The one thing that I think is another treasure in this town is the Johnson School, our neighborhood school. I never want to see that school in jeopardy. I think we have to work as a community together I think we have to value education here and make that school the best that it can be. And I believe we can raise money. We don't need the $25,000 from Northeastern. We can fund the art and music teachers for our school. I'm also going to encourage every Nahant resident to contemplate the Margaret Mead quote that was featured on one of the postcards that was mailed out recently. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. My name is Alice Port. I live at Seven Valley Road. I'm looking at the Boston Globe story from March of this year. Um, I'm looking at the Boston Globe story from March of this year that points out that at that time it was six years ago, now it's almost seven years ago, um, Northeastern Marine Science Center had just four professors. It now employs 51 people, 20 faculty, 20 staff, and 11 postdoctoral scientists. After the expansion, it would employ 87 people, 40 faculty, 25 staff, and 22 postdoctoral students. Like so many people here tonight, I've had a lot of trouble understanding why you're proposing building a 60,000 square foot building. My husband, who could not be here this evening, he's out of the country, 
is the head of a research science center at MGH, Harvard, and MIT. They have 75,000 square feet. It's an immunology research center that studies HIV and TB. So they needed a lot of extra space for all the special um, protected uh, research facilities. They have offices, classrooms, a large auditorium, and all their laboratories, plus a vivarium. They include all of their equipment, and they count, have to count in that 75,000 square feet all the walls, all the, hair, you know, the unused space. They employ over 200 people in the building, and then they have numerous, in the hundreds, I believe, but I have to check that statistic, of associate scientists who come in and out. They host conferences where people come from around the world to go to their conferences. So I was uh, particularly grateful to Susan Solomon, who did all the math for her division and pointed out that the numbers, which I don't believe you're even talking about 87 people anymore, um, reflect just these massive square footage per person. It is just not understandable. So Mr. Martin, when you ask us to, instead of spread rumors around and so forth, I hope you can understand why there is this really profound distrust of what you all are talking about. The story keeps changing. We are not getting, you know, initially there were no labs that were going to be included in this building. Now there are labs that are going to be included. That was in the, the first meeting that we had. So it, none of it's made sense, and certainly this size does not make sense at all. Lastly, I'll just point out that um, I did think the, the pictures were pretty, gee, it doesn't look like you can see much of those buildings at all. But it was from one point of view, one alleged point of view on the top of East Point. And needless to say, there are many points of view. You can walk way out to the, to the, um, the tip. And if you're looking back towards Canoe Beach, I doubt that those pictures are going to be the same. Lastly, um, you may know that uh, many, what, a couple hundred years ago, Nahant had no trees, and it was impossible to grow trees. They cut them down initially so that they could graze cattle and sheep and so forth. And finally, we needed Nahant's Johnny Appleseed, and the historians will tell me if I'm wrong. I think it was Mr. Tudor who built up fences to help grow the initial set of trees. Up on East Point, my sister, my suspicion is that the man from Burlington is correct, that you will plant small trees and they will have a ferocious time growing with the winds that East Point gets. So I, I don't think that we're going to get hidden buildings for quite some time. I, I just really am stumbling over the th why you have to why you're considering. I don't feel as though you've justified the 60,000 square foot of space to us yet. And clearly, from what I've heard, I feel it's way too big for this town. Thanks. Hi, uh, Christine Johnson Lissio, 15 Fox Hill Road. Uh, I wanted to thank the Board of Selectmen and Town Manager for holding this meeting. I think um, we've come a bit of a way since February, and I was at that meeting. But I hope that you all feel the passion that this group of residents feels for their home, for their community. I feel there are still so many unanswered questions. I came here tonight to hear your proposals, and I did listen. But I've heard question after question with no response. So I guess my question is, what is the next step? How are you going to answer this community's questions, especially the questions raised by Susan Solomon? Your space seems well overbuilt for what you're intending. I look at it and my mind is, I don't, I don't even know how to put into words the size of it for that space. But I would like to know from the selectmen, or the town manager, or from Northeastern, how are you addressing our questions and concerns? What is happening next? 
With, with respect to Dr. Solomon, I'm happy to meet with her and I'll reach no, out. No, I mean for the town. Right, this I'm, is not I'm, about a private conversation. This is about a conversation with the town. Right. Uh, well, fair enough. Fair what enough. I, I, but just excuse me. I need, she gave, she had a lot of questions. I need to sit down with her, get all the specifics of her questions, right. and then I will get all the information and you will all see it. Okay, but I'm concerned because she's one person who I, who I thought really raised some very valid points, um, but so did so many other people in this room. So what will be the step to address our concerns and our questions? Or are we anticipating, like Burlington, we're going to wake up and find something there? <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, so, so let me, let me take, um, the hour's late. That's fine. Sure. Sure. Go right ahead. Pat O'Reilly, uh, 1 Harris Street, Nahant. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we live in a democracy. Not, not, not one of those, you know, Washington democracy. This is an actual democracy. We have a town meeting form of government, an open town meeting form of government. Anyone can show up. The whole sometimes 75 people show up, sometimes 600. Under our bylaws, a zoning change requires a two-thirds majority. Two-thirds majority. You, you guys need a, a bylaw change. You need a zoning change to build what you're proposing here. You need to go. You need to go to town meeting, get your two-thirds majority, make a proposal, or else you need to go home. All right, uh, Ralph, Pete, then you can answer, please. May I just have a moment? One quick minute, please. Okay. I am one of those 1,700 signatories. I changed my mind. I found arguments to be unpersuasive. Now, Northeastern, in responding to community concerns in offering new plans, is now being accused of being deceptive. They're trying to be responsive to your needs and you're accusing them of bad faith. This is a moving development. Please pay attention to the next chapters of it. Sorry to interrupt, sir. Quite all right, thank you. So, as we said at the outset, this was a checkpoint. This is uh, a chance to share our thinking, our work with you on how we've responded to concerns and criticisms that we heard not only in February, but we heard over the months that we spent talking with individual citizens and the selectmen. You've given us a, you've given us a lot to think about. We've taken notes. We're also gonna, going to look at the videotape. Let me try and address a couple of things tonight, not, not the entire list, but a couple of things that have, that have come up. F first of all, um, I, I think a, a lot of the concerns were, were, that were raised fall under um, facts. There are some concerns that were raised that fall under the theme of fear, then there are some concerns that fall under the theme of confusion. So with respect to infrastructure, uh, that's, that's not the first time we've heard infrastructure, but we, we can't really get to a point where we address infrastructure unless and until we have some sense of what we're doing with the project. Because if people, as people have noted, What's, what's the, the cost to the town? Both on its infrastructure, with respect to parking, and other concerns that were raised. Uh, we don't know, but we're, we're alert to it, 
And as the conversations go forward, that's a conversation we, will, we, we expect to have with the town, not only with you, but with the selectmen. Traffic. We presented the data that we know based upon the study in November. There are other studies going forward. One of the things that we're prepared to consider is how do we take some of our traffic, some of the traffic that's attributable to us off of your streets? Could we have a shuttle service? Could we have an arrangement at the Wonderland Garage where we, have, where we shuttle people from, from the Wonderland Garage? We're open to ways to alleviate traffic. The, um, one of the concerns that was raised was what happens in the event of a storm surge. A category three hurricane, a storm surge. Jeff can, uh, uh, not Jeff, excuse me, Bob can give you chapter and verse, but we're comfortable that uh, where the building would stand and where the addition would stand would be, be able to withstand any storm surge. Um, let me talk a little bit about the Roxbury and Burlington scenarios, particularly with respect to Roxbury. And I might ask Kathy or John to come up and talk about Burlington because they were specifically involved. First of all, with respect to Boston and Roxbury, we've never used the Dover Amendment. It's, ne it, it's just not been part of our approach to planning and approval. Second, with respect to the dormitory that was built, that's almost, uh, that's about ready to open, we built that on a parking lot that the Northeastern had owned for 40 or 50 years, only after a community approval process that ended up with unanimous approval by the body appointed by the city to oversee the process, and then unanimous approval by the BPDA which, is, which was the successor to the BRA, in order to accelerate our commitment to build a thousand beds within 10 years of the master, master plan. We did not force it down anyone's throat. We went through an entire community approval process, and you can look it up. Let me talk a little bit about the green space. Everyone's right to raise concerns about the green space. Let, let me just put things in proportion with a couple of figures. We own not quite 890,000 square feet at that site. The expansion takes less than 7% of that site. The, the ground that we would disturb, tell me if I'm getting any of this wrong, the, the ground that we would disturb is somewhere between 11,000 and 15,000 feet. You saw the, the, the part of the project that went underground, that's somewhere, but depending on the plan, between 11,000 and 15,000 feet. We are very conscientious about maintaining views, about maintaining access, and enhancing the site. This is not the last word on it. We, we have more to process. But I just wanted to try and put things in proportion. Um, crime. If past is prologue, I'm not sure where the fear of crime comes from. I, I, I understand that with any change, people worry about crime. But I don't think that the Marine Science Center has been a breeder or a breeding ground or a hotbed of crime? No, no, my good friend Carl mentioned it. <laughs> and, I, and I just want to make sure, if there are concerns, you tell us what they are. But I, I, I don't think, I don't think it, that has been a, a source of concern in the past. If it is, we want to hear about it. Um, Kathy, you want to address Burlington? Does this work? Hello? Yeah, it works. Oh, yep. it does. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Kathy Spiegelman, Vice President for Campus Planning. Uh, John and I saw each other through the Burlington process, and thank you for sharing that quote 
because I meant it at the time. I think Northeastern meant it. And I think Ralph is saying they mean it now. We have an agreement with the trustees of reservations. They have reached their funding. They are going to be improving Mary Cummings Park, which has been ignored by anybody except the friends for Mary Cummings who have tried very hard to keep its quality up. No? Um, the site, the campus in Burlington is a campus that's focused on national security. It is surrounded by the Mary Cummings Park. It too was a military site with bunkers underneath. And uh, the dialogue with the community um, that happened before the planning board, exactly as John described it, was a, a conversation about how could Northeastern do a better job of helping take care of the park. And uh, we've now reached an agreement with the trustees of reservations who are going to be appointed by the city of Boston to run that park to actually, in partnership with them, help them do things to make that park uh, improved, be able to be used and enjoyed by more people. And uh, there is, it is a campus there, and there will be more change on that campus. And our expectation and hope, as it is here in Northeastern, would be that the things that we do actually can enhance the open space that's around where we're building and that we can find avenues for partnerships. Um, that is a sincere aspiration in Burlington. It is here in Nahant and I uh, agree that the site here is very special as was the site in Burlington. Um, My last statement. <clears throat> uh, there are obviously other questions that emerge tonight, one of which is relates to our programming versus MIT's versus MGH. Um, we'll get back to you with facts and figures. The one thing I've learned about academia and research is that research is not fungible. What goes on in one lab that exists by the water versus, versus what goes on in a, in a campus site not surrounded by water. One, one thing that, that, another thing I've learned is that wet labs are very different from dry labs, and when you have the two together, they require different programmatic aspects. We will get back with, to you with the specifics on our programming. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Uh, you made one mistake in your speech. Mr. Costin, Mr. Costin, come up here to the mic, please. Mr. Costin will be our last speaker. Uh, my name is Thomas Costin, uh, 54 Mayolis Road. You made one mistake in your speech when you turned to the, turned to the selectmen and said, we will meet with them. You're speaking now to the town government here. The people, this is a, the, the purest form of democracy. They represent us. They are our public servants. They made a mistake when they broke the law by going up and meeting individually with Northeastern because the, the law says that they have to be, post it and let us know. We are the ones that make the final decision on what is going to go there, not the town selectmen. Thank you. I respect the gentleman's passion. I thought I said we will get back to you. Um, regardless, I respect your passion. We will get back to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us, and thank you, and good night. Motion to adjourn. I will second that motion. All in favor, aye, aye. Adjourn.